Hello, everyone. My name is Arun Sari Howell. I'm an associate professor of medicine and the lead geriatrician at Temple University Hospital. Today, we'll discuss aging and frailty management in a geriatric population. And please feel free to scan this QR code on the first page here to access all the resources and tools that we'll discuss during the talk today. I have no disclosure to report. Now imagine it's 4.50 p.m. and your last patient, Mrs. H, just showed up. She's a 69-year-old woman who's been declining at home with falls, confusion, weight loss. You feel that the medications you've been prescribing for hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, none of them are working because these geriatric syndromes are in the way. What good are prescriptions if she can't remember to take them? What good are bisphosphonates if she falls down the stairs? It's even been harder and harder for you to do anything at all because she barely makes it to clinic anymore. And you're glad that she made it today because you had wanted to tease out some of these issues. But there's so little time left in the visit and you're overwhelmed by the multiple geriatric issues that could be going on. You don't know where or how to start. So you decided to quickly address her blood pressure and send her home. If this has never happened to you, it will sooner rather than later as people with HIV continue to grow older. And if a similar scenario has happened to you, then I'm here to walk you through how to effectively screen and sort through this tangle of geriatric syndromes, possibly in less than 15 minutes, so that you can restore the things that matter, her function, her cognition, so that you can provide her with a healthy foundation that will allow your other treatments and interventions to succeed. Here's a roadmap for today. First, we'll address why. Why do you, as an HIV clinician, need to understand and have geriatric competencies? Then we'll address what? How do we prioritize which geriatric domains to do in a short clinic visit? Then we'll address how. What are the best tools to use for each geriatric domain? Then we'll talk about who. Who should be doing these domains? And the answer is hopefully not just the physician by themselves. First, we'll talk about why. Why as an HIV clinician, do you need to know geriatric competencies? Well, the answer is our patients are aging. On the left here, you will see Freddie Mercury. He's the lead singer of the band Queen. He was diagnosed with HIV in 1987 and died soon after in 1991 before ART or antiretroviral therapy became available in 1996, after which there was a dramatic decrease in HIV-related deaths. On the right here, you will see Greg Luganis. He's the American Olympic diver. He was diagnosed in 1988 and he is still alive today. He is 61 in this picture and he's probably way fitter than I am. In the post-art world, you will see more and more older patients who survived AIDS, where death is no longer imminent, and death might not even be related to HIV anymore. Some of these patients who survived will have aged well, like Greg Luganis, but many others will look a lot like our patients, Mrs. H. And the challenge is, how do we help people with HIV age well while also helping those who have become sick and frail. In the post-art world, there are two things that we're seeing. The first thing is that there are more and more people with HIV over the age of 50. But also within this population, we're seeing increased morbidity and geriatric syndromes. So here are some statistics to help you understand how many people with HIV are over the age of 50 years old. Of all the new HIV diagnoses that you will make this year, one in six will be over the age of 50. That's as high as 17%. We already know that two years ago in 2020, 
up to 21% of people with HIV worldwide was over the age of 50. And in less than 10 years, in 2030, up to 70% of patients with HIV in the U.S. will be over the age of 50. That's a lot. Now, within this population, we also see increased morbidity and geriatric syndromes. And this is mainly due to three reasons. The first reason is that these patients were exposed to traditional risk factors that correlate with common comorbid conditions. These include things like smoking, alcohol, substance use disorder. Another important traditional risk factor is hepatitis C co-infection which has independent neurotoxic effects from pro-inflammatory cytokines induced by the hep C core protein. It also has independent effects from HIV in increasing fracture risk, and this is possibly through alterations in the calcioterpic and the gonadotropic hormone levels and weight loss. Other than traditional risk factors, we also have HIV-related risk factors that contribute to increased morbidity. The first HIV-related risk factor is living with the chronic HIV infection itself. We find that despite excellent viral control, patients still have chronic T cell activation and increased production of pro-inflammatory cytokines that results in low-level inflammation that causes multiple end organ damage. These include things like increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Being on R for a long time is also another HIV-related risk factor. The older adults who aged with HIV were exposed to older generations of ART that has less than optimal side effects. These include medications like tenofovir disoprosyl fumarate, or TDF, which can cause renal damage and has been shown to cause bone mineral density loss. There are also some other HIV-related medications that patients may have received to treat or prevent opportunistic infections with long-term side effects. For example, ketoconazole, which we use for fungal infection, may correlate with accelerated bone loss. We also have the issue of accelerated versus accentuated aging, which are unique to people living with HIV. Another way in which HIV was found to increase morbidity is that it seems to cause accelerated or accentuated aging. There's still some debate on which one and which one it is may depend on which disease entity you're talking about. On the left here, you'll see the graph for accelerated aging, which you will see that the comorbidities happen sooner, but at the same frequency as people without HIV. Versus on the right here, you'll see the graph for accentuated aging, which means that the disease happens at the same age group, but at a higher frequency. Even though it is unclear whether it is accentuated or ex accelerated aging, what we know for sure is that chronic HIV infection results in increased multimorbidity in people with HIV. Based on this graph, you can see that compared to the uninfected in the same age group, there are higher proportions of HIV patients with multiple diseases. For example, in the 65 plus age group, you'll see that there are many more HIV patients who have more than three diseases compared to those who are uninfected. Let's go back to our patient. Just a quick reminder, Mrs. H, she's 89, she has hypertension and diabetes, and there are concerns for dementia because the daughter is worried about some confusion, fall, and weight loss at home. Now we'll talk about what. How do we prioritize which geriatric syndromes to screen for? And usually what I think about are two things. I think about the domains that are most likely to kill the patient and also the domains that are most important to patient. In clinic, I would usually sit down with the family and the patient, and I would say, I would pick one domain and you pick one. The caveat is that I would recommend not trying to do all the domains at once, because this could be overwhelming to the patient and to the family. I recommend using these two important outcomes to prioritize the important domains that you want to do first, and then leave the non-emergent domains for later visits. Now we'll discuss how 
what are the best tools to use for each geriatric domain? And here's a quick table that I'll go through, and then we'll discuss each tool in detail later in the talk. But right off the bat, you can see that none of these tools need any medical degree to use. So your medical students or volunteers can do them. For function, I recommend using the activities of daily living or the ADL and the instrumental activities of daily living or the IADL. Together, these tools take about three minutes to do. For fall, you can do either or both subjective and objective screening for fall. For subjective, you can ask if the patient has had a fall in the past 12 months, and that takes less than a minute to do. For objective screening, you can do time get up and go test, and that takes less than a minute to do. For cognition, I recommend using the mini cock, which takes less than three minutes to do. For depression, I recommend using the PHQ-2, which takes less than a minute to do. For nutrition, I recommend using the RNSH, which takes about five minutes to do. For advanced care planning, and we'll talk about this in more detail, I recommend just doing the healthcare proxy during the first visit, and that takes less than a minute to do. So for these fundamental domains, it could take less than 15 minutes to do all of them, but we'll also discuss other strategies to make all these even shorter than 15 minutes by being creative about how you perform these tests. And please feel free to go to this QR code to save these tools for later use in your practice. Now we'll discuss a few extra domains that I don't do routinely. For frailty, I don't usually screen for it because there hasn't been a consistent or consensus in the literature in terms of effective interventions that will change patient outcomes that can be reproducible in clinic. However, if you're looking to prognosticate, frailty is a great tool. There is a lot of literature that talks about how to use frailty to screen for patient important outcomes like length of stay in the hospital or the risk of having to go to nursing homes for all kinds of interventions, including common surgeries, chemotherapy, or common medical procedures. If you're looking to screen for frailty, I recommend using the FREED frailty phenotype that's modified, which can be found in this QR code. And I recommend using this tool because it uses the ADLs or the activities of daily living and the time get up and go test as two of its components, so already you're halfway done. If you're looking to screen for caregiver burden, I recommend using the caregiver self-assessment, which is recommended by the American Geriatric Society, and it takes about five minutes to do. For elder abuse, the evidence does not recommend routine screening unless you have worrisome signs like bruising. If you're looking to screen, I would use the Elder Abuse Suspicion Index, which takes about two minutes to do and can be found at this QR code. Let's go into function. For the ADLs and IADLs, which takes about three minutes to do, I really like these tools because they can translate directly to services that you would need to refer the patient to. For example, if the patient says that they cannot bathe or dress themselves, which is part of the ADL, then you know that you would need to refer the patient to some type of home health aid to help them complete these ADLs in the home. If the patient says that they can no longer manage their medications, which is an IADL, you should refer the patient to a home nurse who can come in to set up and give the patient medications. If the patient says that they have problem with toileting, walking, or transferring, you should refer the patient for home physical therapy if the patient says that they have problems figuring out transportation, which is part of IADLs, then you should connect patients with transportation resources. If they say that they can't cook anymore, which is part of an IADL, you should connect patients with some food security resources. In the U.S. here, we have programs like Meals on Wheels that can help patients with that. If the patient says that they can no longer climb stairs, which is part of an ADL, you can order a stair lift for the patient. Or if they say that they cannot manage their finances anymore, which is part of an IADL, then you should discuss with the family 
to have them look into a financial power of attorney. For fall, like I mentioned prior, you can do either or both subjective and objective screening for fall. For subjective, you can ask the patient quickly if they have had a fall in the past 12 months. For objective, you can do the time, get up and go test. And together, these take less than two minutes to do. And here's how I usually do the time, get up and go test. I ask the patient to hug themselves, get up from the chair, walk three meters, turn around, walk back another three meters, and then sit down. And by doing this time, get up and go test, you're basically testing for three components. When the patient gets up from the chair without using their hands, you're testing for proximal muscle strength. When the patient's walking, you're testing for gait speed. And when the patient turns around, which is when most patients are likely to fall, you're testing for balance. I usually tell my students that if the patient uses a cane or a walker at home, you want them to be able to use that during the test. And you want to make sure that you walk next to the patient the whole time during the test so that if they were to fall, especially when they turn around, you're right there ready to catch them. Per the CDC, if the patient takes longer than 12 seconds to do the time up and go test, then they are at risk of having a fall. Now, if you are limited by time or space, you can break down the time up and go test into its individual components and still get useful information without having to do the whole test. For example, I have worked with clinicians who work in prison and they're unable to do part of the test because the prisoners come in shackled at their angles. So what you can do is while you're in the exam room, even if you don't have space and the patients are shackled, you can ask them to get up from the exam table without using their hands and still test for proximal muscle strength. Then you can ask them to turn around in front of you while they're shackled and still test for balance, even if you can't do the whole test. For cognition, I recommend using the mini cock, which takes about three minutes to do. And the mini cock is basically a three item recall combined with the clock drawing test. And the picture on the left here explains to you how you would score a mini cock. If the patient doesn't recall anything and it was zero out of three, the patient is probably at risk of dementia. Now, if the patient is very good and they recall three out of three, then they're probably not at risk of dementia, regardless of what the clock looks. Now, if the patient is in the middle and they're recalling one out to two out of three, then you need to look at the clock. If the clock is normal, then they're probably not at risk. But if the clock is abnormal, then they may be at risk of dementia. And I picked the mini cock because it is one of the shortest screening tests that we have for cognition, which sensitivities that rival longer tests. For example, the mini cock has a sensitivity of about 76% compared to 86% of the MMSE, which is a much longer test. In clinic, I usually make sure that the family is in the room when I do the test if possible, because you may encounter older adult patients who minimize their cognitive deficits. So to make sure that there's no disagreements on what's actually happening with the patient, having everyone in the room when you do the test can help make sure that everyone's on the same page. I also like the mini cock because it focuses on two components that are some of the most translatable to services needed. If there are deficits in recall, then you know that any task that involves memory is at risk. And you might wanna send the nurse into the home to help patients remember to take medications. Or if patients go to appointments, you wanna make sure that someone goes with them to help listen to the doctors and remember what the doctors say. Now for the clock, which tests for executive dysfunction, that correlates directly to deficits in IADLs or the instrumental activities of daily living. And this means that if the patient can't draw a clock, you want to send nurses into the home to help manage medications, set patients up with financial power of attorney, like what we mentioned before. Now, here's the caveat with using the mini clock in clinic. 
the mini cough is a screening test. It's not a confirmatory test. So if someone tests positive with a mini cough in your clinic, don't tell the patient that they have dementia just yet. You need to do a confirmatory test. And there's no consensus on the best test to screen for cognitive impairment in patients with HIV. But I would recommend using the MOCA or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment for two reasons. First, in the post-art era, where patients are well controlled, the incidence of HIV-associated dementia is very low at this point. And you're looking at about two to 4% incidence rate. So in clinic, you're going to need a tool that can test for all cause dementia because most likely the causes of cognitive impairment in well-controlled HIV patients are probably going to be Alzheimer's or vascular dementia here in North America. The other reason why I like the MOCA as well is that it's a very good test to look for executive dysfunction versus a more popular test that we use a lot, the MMSC, does not test for executive dysfunction, which can be a common feature in HIV-associated dementia among other causes of dementia. The other important caveat with doing cognitive screening in clinic is that if the test is positive and you're about to tell the family and the patient that they have dementia, you are effectively delivering bad news. So please be prepared to give the time and space for the patient and their family members to react to this bad news. For depression, I recommend using the PHQ-2, which takes less than one minute to do. And I like the PHQ-2 because it's usually heavily embedded in most electronic medical records. And I would recommend that you screen for depression before you do the cognition screen, because as we know, depression can present as pseudo-dementia. And if depression is not well controlled when you do the cognitive screening, it can falsely lower the cognitive screening scores. For nutrition, I recommend using the RNSH, which takes about five minutes to do. And that's because this is the only tool that was validated in people with HIV. And it also nicely looked at important outcomes such as food insecurity, it uses anthropometric measures like the BMI, and it asks about important symptoms related to nutrition such as difficulty swallowing, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. For advanced care planning, I recommend just starting with asking for the healthcare proxy, and that takes about less than one minute to do. And here's how I usually do it. I usually try to address this during a routine visit or a yearly checkup, so that is not scary for the patient. And I usually say, this is a routine thing that I ask all of my patients, regardless of what their age is. I have one and I want you to have one too. Have you heard of a healthcare proxy before? And after that, I ask them to identify a healthcare proxy. I document it right away on paper in clinic. And after that, you can give the patient some homework and say, start this conversation at home. Now that you have picked a healthcare proxy, you should talk to your person about what you want your healthcare to look like. And you should give guiding questions like what's important in your life or what makes life unacceptable. But a lot of that conversation can happen at home on the patient's own pace without having to take up a lot of time in your clinic visit. Now we'll talk about who. Who should be doing this screening test? And the hope is that it's not just a physician trying to do all these tests by yourself. Because like we mentioned before, none of these tools require any medical degrees to use. So here are some strategies to help physicians practice at the top of their license. As much as you can, you should try to do these tests at home because they basically are forms that can be filled out. And you can do this on paper by mailing these forms to the patient's home. Or if you have a patient portal on the computer, they can do it through the computer as well. If that didn't work out, you can have the patient try to do these forms in the waiting room, either on paper on a clipboard or even on an iPad, and caregivers can help as needed. If that doesn't work, then you can ask non-physician personnel in your clinic 
like medical students or volunteers to try to do some of these tests while they're rooming the patient. And you can ask for specific members of your team to help screen some of the related domains. For example, if you have a social worker, you can ask them to perhaps screen for function using the ADLs or ADLs, or they can also screen for depression, while your dietitians can maybe help you screen for malnutrition using the RNSH. Now let's go back to our patient, Mrs. H, she's 89, hypertension, diabetes, we worried about dementia. In a 15 minute visit, this is how I would prioritize all the domains. First, I would do as many domains as I could at home. And that is probably the PSQ2, which again, you wanna make sure that you do it before you try to do cognitive screening in clinic. And that can be done on a paper form with the help of a caregiver. Other things that I would try to have the patients and the caregiver fill out at home include functional assessment with the ADLs and IADLs, make sure they document healthcare proxy on paper, they can do the RNSH for nutrition at home, and they can say yes or no to fall in the past 12 months. Now, when they're in clinic, you want to prioritize the tests that need to be done in person, which comes out to be the Minicoc and the time get up and go test. And this can be done by students or volunteers to give you close to 11 minutes to discuss the results, which is what physicians do best. And this can help physicians practice at the top of their license. Today, we don't really have time to go into the management of all the geriatric syndromes if they were to test positive. But if you're looking to learn more and if you're looking to develop geriatric competencies, I recommend exploring this free HIV and aging course from the American Academy of HIV Medicine. And you can use this QR code to go to the website and register for the course. It is completely free and is offered once a year. In summary, today we talked about why. Why do you as HIV clinicians need to have geriatric competencies? And the answer is people with HIV are aging worldwide. We also talked about what, how do we prioritize which geriatric domains to do first? And remember, you want to think about the domains that are most likely to kill patients and the domains that are important to them. You pick one and I pick one. We also addressed who, who should be doing these screening tests. And the answer is you should try to do as many forms at home as possible, leaving the in-person test, which is the mini cop and the time up and go test to be done in clinic by non-physician volunteers to maximize your time. We also addressed how, what are the best tools to use to screen for these geriatric syndromes and all the tools that I provided you today all take less than five minutes and none of them required any medical degree to do. If you have any more questions, please feel free to connect with me through email or through Twitter. And please feel free to go to this QR code to download the resources that we talked about today for later use in your clinic. Thank you so much.